Hello students, welcome to our spring semester lecture course, Advanced Materials for Energy and Information. In today's lecture, we shall discuss about the basic ideas about materials. This is very easy to understand. In fact, the entire lecture has been made in such a way so as to keep the things very simple. I hope you enjoy to learn. Let me first elaborate what we are going to learn in this course. Let me first introduce it. To begin with, I must say a few words about this lecture course, which is about advanced materials for energy and information. The present era is the era of renewable energy and advanced information technology. With continued growth of population, there has been a continued growth in the demand for energy resources apart from the conventional fossil fuels, which has created huge pollution and threat to the environment. The course presents a rigorous discussion on the materials in the current research to develop methods for harnessing energy from sustainable renewable resources such as sun, wind, water, ocean, earth, nuclear materials and materials from energy storage, namely batteries and supercapacitors. The lectures also deal with the pros and cons of the machinery designed for harnessing renewable energy on the environment and various ecosystems. The second part of the course will deal with the advanced materials for information technology. This includes a general description about the materials humankind developed through ages in different regions across the globe by independent civilizations. Later, the civilizations developed interesting methods of communication with another neighboring as well as distant civilizations and learned to work in unison to invent advanced materials and methods for greater achievements. With course of time, humans realize the need of exploring outer space and communicating with aliens. The heart of information technology lies in the advent of computers and data processing. In this part of the lecture, we shall explore and learn about the generations of computers in human life, ranging from desktop to mobile cell phones, critical materials and their processing technologies, programming languages, satellite and communication, and future materials. In the Last but not the least, human beings find a huge reason to invent its own information, that is origin, development, and evolution. This part of the lecture has been summarized under the topic genetics, human genome, and evolution. The aim of this lecture course is to build in a strong motivation towards innovative research among the students. Every year, researchers around the world have been constantly working round the clock to bring better materials for future generation regarding energy and information, so as to uplift the quality of life and keeping the environment safe at the same time. The students are supposed to participate in quiz, discussions, debates, and assignments all together in classroom activities to secure their scores and construct a positive evaluation. Unfortunately, because of coronavirus outbreak, we shall limit our response activities up to writing the assignments only. Before we approach to our mid-semester examination, we are supposed to complete the first part of our lecture series, that is the uh, introduction part, which is common to both the lecture parts. It will contain the human civilization and early materials for energy and information. This is a very interesting part. And then we will approach to renewable energy, part one, solar and wind energy, then part two, hydropower, hydro energy, geothermal and ocean energy, then renewable energy, part three, that will be biomass energy and nuclear energy. And then we'll learn about the energy storage materials, batteries and supercapacitors. And we shall also learn about the fuel cells. That is solid oxide fuel cells, proton fuel cells, polymer exchange membrane fuel cells, microbial fuel cells. And then we will discuss about the relative merits, that is advantages and disadvantages of the advanced energy materials to the environment and human life. After we finish our middle semester examination, we will approach to the second part of our lecture course, that is materials for information technology. We shall learn about the history of information technology, materials through in, uh, for information through ages. Then we shall learn about the generation of computers, the critical materials 
of importance in the information revolu revolution. Then we shall learn about the material processing of different materials utilized in the information technology and the, the characterization. Then we shall have some miscellaneous topics which will include programming language, satellite and communication. You can also suggest topics of your interest. I shall try to include in the lecture. And then we shall learn about communication and future materials. And last but not the least, we shall also learn about human genome and evolution. So, so I welcome uh, all of you to the spring semester 2020. Let's learn and enjoy learning. We all know that the early human beings were the hunter-gatherers, but we shall see the story with a different viewpoint. It is interesting as well as important to know where we came from, and it is even more interesting to know where we are heading towards. Here in this picture, you can see the four major civilizations of the world, namely Mesopotamian civilization, which formed at the banks of the rivers Tigris and Euphrates, Nile River civilization in Egypt, Indus Valley River civilization or Harappan civilization in India, and Yellow River civilization in China. All these civilizations have been studied to have arisen independently of each other approximately 20,000 to 1,500 years ago. The early part of these civilizations were very common. They came up, existed, and flourished at or near river valley basins because rivers provided water for irrigation, domestic utilization, transportation, and overall development of the entire civilization. One of the most important discoveries by human beings is considered to be fire. Discovery of fire introduced human beings the primary source of energy, which the human beings could create as and when required. Gradually, fire was discovered to be utilized in many different ways. As here we can see in the pictures, fire provides warmth during the chilly winter nights in a way, it helped the human beings to build settlements to continue to stay at a place. Fire found the most common use in defense from the attacks of jungle bees. It was utilized as a source of light for visibility in the night time. This might have proven as a boon for the migrating tribes during the time of natural disasters such as floods, storms, outbreak of diseases, etc. Much later, but certainly, it was a breakthrough invention by the human beings that it learned to cook. Here, the conclusion is that humans came to know about the combustible materials that can be utilized to create fire and experience heat energy, light energy, and explore many different applications. It is believed to be the fire as a source of energy which led to people building human families and settlements, which is late, in the later times grew bigger to make villages and towns. Human beings began gathering around the fire and started communicating. It is believed that the first and primitive common language for communication must have started during such gatherings. As a result of creating a common spoken language, humans thought to store the information which during earlier times were primitive drawings on the walls of the caves. The humans could now store food and save time to think about creating new things rather than hunting all the time for food. Discovery of fire certainly brought a turning point in the beginning for rising different civilization. Human beings started making tools for various applications, primarily for hunting, agriculture for growing food grains, and taming different animals for its safety, food, and survival. Fire brought another great discovery to the human beings, that is clay pottery. It is believed that during one of such gatherings around the fire, humans discovered that the soil on the ground beneath the fire became hard and insoluble or intact in water. They used this knowledge to design and prepare clay pots for food and water storage. Fired clay pots are usually durable. The remains and ruins of such clay pots obtained during excavation have been very useful to understand the antiquity of human civilization in different regions of the world. This was the Stone Age. 
The concept of metallurgy and development of different metal alloys for various applications was considered to be another turning point after the discovery of fire. Fire enabled human beings to discover making tools from metals and advent from the Stone Age, namely Bronze Age, Iron Age, Mechanical Age, Industrialization and the Electronic Age. Here in this part, we shall discuss about the renewable energy resources the human beings already had been utilizing since ancient times. One of the most utilized one is the solar energy. Solar energy is the energy from the sun in the form of light, heat, and nowadays also can be converted into electricity. Sun is the primary source of energy to the earth and can be harvested either directly or indirectly. For example, the energy harvested from wind and biomass is an indirect form of solar energy. One of the prominent evidences come from the remains of human dwellings installed during different times in the history and we can collect information from. The amount of light and duration of longer availability depending upon east-west direction has influenced the architecture in every era and civilizations. The housing in colder places required more sunlight and warmth so they were designed as southwest facing. In these pictures, the position of the sun during winters and summers have been shown. As the sun's path on the earth at a location moves away from the equator during winter and summer as you can see by the shadow, the housing are used to be installed as south facing to receive more sunlight during the winter season because the winters are of longer duration in the cold countries. Here you can see in the pictures of some of the reconstructed dwellings from the Stone Age. The materials in the housing structures were arranged in such a way so as to receive more sunlight to keep the interiors warm. During the winter season, because the winters are of longer duration in the cold countries, the housings were mostly made of south facing. During the prehistoric times, when the Stone Age was predominant, humans used the stones, mammoth bones, wood to construct dwellings. In the first picture on the right top, we can see the reconstructed architecture of a stone hedge. In the second picture on the top left is the reconstructed architecture of a housing made up of mammoth bones and tusks from one of the oldest civilization, Missouri, during 24,000 to 12,000 BC in Ukraine. And in the third picture shows a reconstructed architecture of Neolithic dwelling which used both stones and wood. Here we can see some more pictures of different housing structures from different civilizations. Here we can notice very easily about either the materials employed for construction or the natural site selected for the dwelling. The humans have taken into sincere consideration of sunlight or solar incidences to erect the architecture. In the first picture, the ancient housing of Tatwin in Tunisia and we can see the sun facing front of the construction. Down below is the ancient town of Hesenkif in Turkey, which was a cliff dwelling and facing the solar incident site. Next is the ruins of a city excavated at Rakhigarhi in India, which shows the direction of the walls erected. And down below is the Parthenon atop in Greece and the sunlight facing direction of the architecture is clearly noticed. The cliff palace in Mesa Verde National Park in Colorado is the largest cliff dwelling in the North America. Humans had already discovered it, how to build a shelter so as to utilize the solar energy maximum. The people who once lived there had lives that revolved around the sun in more ways than one. The passive solar energy and the weather protection provided by the monstrous overhanging cliff above the settlement is just one nice example. Several million years before the modern man or homo sapiens appeared in the fossil records, our ape-man cave dwelling ancestors lived under naturally occurring stone arch cave entrances. They did not invent arches or build them. 
but as human intelligence improved our predecessors did observe how they were living under arches in harmony with nature if the cave opening accidentally faced the equator they were more comfortable in the summer and winter the ancient greeks abstracted this knowledge and built their homes around it as the ancient greeks ran into fuel shortages they started to think more about how to design buildings so as to maximize the heat gain and retention during winter months they began orienting buildings and entire city grids in such a way so that the houses had extra southern exposure to the to capture the sun rays from low in the sky in the coldest part of the year Romans eventually took things a step further by adding glasses to their windows in order to retain more of the heat gathered from the sunlight. This added an advantage in terms of the stronger structure that requires less building material compared to the horizontal or straight stones or woods. Here we can see some more examples of arch top doors and windows this design is inspired from the natural cave designs and various kinds of designs here can explain better here is a collection of pictures of housing architecture from different parts of the world on contrary to the south facing entrance housing in the colder countries the tropical countries chose to build east facing houses so as to receive the calmer sun rays than to receive afternoon hot rays during the afternoon and evening part of the day the tropical regions have relatively and significantly shorter winters and longer summer season this explains how the housing designs as well as the materials were chosen differently by humans from different civilizations depending upon the solar energy and the weather Here we can see some more examples of housing architecture to utilize the solar energy by different civilizations. The front part of the house, the roofing is extended to little longer so as to escape the solar incidence during the noon part of the day as well as to save the housing interiors from the extra heat. But the, during the winter part, the longer radiations could enter into the house to keep the interiors warm. Not only housing architecture, the solar incidence was also considered as one of the important bases for building observatories to record the day length and time. Here we can see some of the pictures from observatories. The picture on the top left is the horizontal sundial located in Australia and some of the pictures from the sundials and uh, solar instruments at Jantar Mantar, India and there is one observatory in South Korea at Chomsongdae in Gyeongju, which is the oldest such construction found in Asia. Now we shall discuss about the role of solar energy in food storage. Apart from creating the seasonal patterns which directly affects the agriculture, the solar energy is also utilized by the human beings for preserving food. Here we can see the kimchi pots arranged across the slope of a hill for facing the solar rays and facilitating the natural fermentation process. In the picture down below is the kimchi pot which are even buried inside the earth to trap the thermal energy in the soil. In ancient times, people were largely dependent upon the solar day length for kimchi making. But nowadays, kimchi refrigerators are available and are used for this purpose. Although kimchi making is a huge food processing industry in South Korea, and heavily dependent on special kimchi refrigerators, the South Koreans still regard this can never match the taste of traditional kimchi from the buried pots. In the top right hand picture are the pickle making in Southeast Asian countries, primarily the Indian countries, and the list of uh, collection of different kinds of pickles here shown in the jars, which are very popular in the Indian cuisine. This 
is an example of solar drying of agriculture products, which is largely used by both tropical and cold countries. And these pictures are the drying of chilies, fig, gourd, and much perishable, the tomatoes and persimmons have been shown. And also these vegetables can be freeze dry so as to stop it from being perished and can be stored for longer times for food safety. Here are some more examples of drying of food vegetables. These are some of the dried examples of fresh vegetables, fruits, herbs, plums, fishes and shrimps. It is unknown since when the human beings started drying of food and domesticated this process, but it is something, a practice which is alive till today. Solar energy is instrumental for food storage. The dried vegetables are now in huge demand as it is easier to save from perishing and trade to distant places. Solar energy is free of cost and free of pollution and return good yields in profit. Wind energy is another valuable renewable resource and can be utilized in many ways. Moving air is called wind and wind energy is utilizable energy harnessed from the kinetic energy of the moving air. Wind is an indirect form of solar energy. It is created during the heating of the atmosphere by solar energy, earth and oceans. It is estimated that 1 to 2 percent of the solar radiation incident on this earth is converted to wind energy and early forms of wind turbines were the windmills. The history of windmills is very old. Windmills are known to exist since 1st century AD and these were used for grinding grains. Modern days wind turbines are the new designs invented during 19th century AD. Modern turbines which exist at the present time were created after years of innovation and scientific research. Modern turbines are designed to produce electricity. Windmills are known to exist since 1st century AD and these were used for for pumping of water and grinding of grains. Windmills are used to pump water in China in 200 BC and grind grains in Persia in the Middle East as well. In India, Tibet and China, there had been age-old traditions of installing prayer wheels since the origin of Buddhist monasteries. Other major applications we have in evidence is sailboards since 5000 BC which drove across and down the river Nile. Indus Valley civilization people had developed functional maritime for trade and collaboration across different cities and civilizations and mainly by the sea route through these sailboats. Geothermal energy is apparent at the places where the earth's crust is thin and water bodies have boiling waters such as hot springs and geysers. In ancient times, the hot mineral springs have been used for bathing, cooking and eating. They also felt that mineral, especially sulfur rich waters, was a natural way to heal and cure skin diseases. Geothermal energy is created from conversion of residual heat which is continuously produced inside the earth by the radioactive decomposition of the rocks arising from the movement of the lithospheric plates. This energy is located everywhere below the earth's surface. Where the earth's crust is thin, this energy comes out in the form of hot springs or geysers. The 10 km layer of the earth's mantle contains enough energy to cover the global energy demand for several thousand years. The most potent areas for utilization of geothermal energy are located on the boundaries of the lithospheric plates. One of the most active geothermal areas in the world is situated in the Pacific Ocean and is called as Ring of Fire. Most of the USA geothermal power plants are installed along the coastal areas of western states and close to this Ring of Fire. Utilization of geothermal energies dates back to Paleolithic times. 
Here in these pictures, we can see people taking bath in hot water spring. The hot water spring in India are rich in the minerals and known to heal and cure skin diseases. Another picture shows a lady in the Maori village in New Zealand for cooking food. In this slide, we shall see the utilization of biomass energy other than burning it to make fire to cook food, that is heating the house floor for keeping it warm during the winters. Here is a picture of a structure called Ondol in old houses in South Korea. The floor part of the house is kept hollow and layered with clay and rocks and outside is constructed a kitchen. Fire is lit for cooking food and the hot air is siphoned inside the hollow area under the floor. The floor is supported by pillars. The hot air flowing under the floor keeps the house warm and cozy for the people residing inside. At the outside, is the chimney at the opposite end to extract the fumes out. In modern housings, underfloor heating system and radiators are employed. Radiators are more common in Western countries, whereas in South Korea, the underfloor heating system is more popular. This comes from the evolution from the age-old architectural methods of Ondol and here in this picture a comparison between two systems are shown. The underfloor heating system is considered to be an advantage. The underfloor heating system consists of efficient electric or hydronic heating elements which are embedded in cementitious flooring with excellent thermal conduction properties which creates more comfortable temperature throughout the room space as well as uniform and gradual heat distribution across the entire room. On the other hand, the radiating heating system consists of heating radiators run by electricity and it creates warm head cold feet syndrome resulting from heat in the upper layers. Also, the convection carriers heat up the walls more to the ceiling and misses the room interiors and the floor areas. At the same time, the water needs to be hotter in convectional radiator system than in hydronic underfloor heating system. Below are some examples of the floor heating system in construction in the Korean houses. This brings us to conclude the introductory part of today's lecture on materials for energy. The next part will deal with the materials for information, which is very interesting. Here you have to answer a question. And this is your assignment question. Which of the early inventions do you think is most crucial and why? Please write one to two paragraphs explaining your opinion and email to me. Your submission of assignment answers will mark your attendance as well. Let's move on to the next part of the lecture. It is going to be very interesting to know how it is started and how we see it today. Humans have been storing, retrieving, manipulating and communicating information since time immemorial, which is called prehistoric era. The Asians in India and China more than 8000 BC and Sumerians in Mesopotamia nearly 5000 BC have been knowing systematic writing. The term information technology appeared for the first time in 1958 in an article by Harold J. Levi and Thomas L. Whistler published in Harvard Business Review. Based on the storage and processing technologies employed, it is possible to distinguish four distinct phases of IT development. First is the pre-mechanical era, which lasted between 10,000 BC to 1450 AD. Then came the mechanical era, which lasted between 1450 to 1840 AD. And then came the electromechanical era, which lasted between 1840 AD to 1940 AD. And the electronic era, which started from 1940 and continues till present. During the pre-mechanical era of prehistoric times, the main methods of collecting, interpreting and storing information were, but not limited to, counting on fingers and pebbles. 
hash marks on the walls of the caves, cliff, mud or stone dwelling, hash marks on sand and earth. The main methods of writing during the prehistoric times and early civilization days were cave paintings and drawings. The human dwellings in the caves did know about ink and method to draw structures using some stylus or reed-like apparatus. In the earliest four distinct civilizations, namely Indus Valley civilizations in India, Yellow River civilization of China, Nile River civilization in Egypt, and Mesopotamian civilization that formed on the banks of Tigris and Euphrates, independently developed their own materials and methods of writing and storing information. Before we begin to learn about the systematic writing methods of manuscripts, we can take a look how early writing methods look like. Of many examples, I have chosen here two of the oldest cave paintings for the reference. The first one is Bhimbetka cave paintings in India. And Bhimbetka caves are found to have sheltered human beings for more than 100,000 years. Some of the paintings found here are as old as 30,000 years. Second example is of archaeological site of Kakadu National Park in Australia, which are known to have sheltered human beings for about 40,000 years. The Aboriginal people still live there, although they have changed a lot to resonate with the modern day life, but many of their customs are still age old. The striking features in these paintings is the ink material which have lasted for so long and is still existing. Another pattern of rock arts or cave arts is the petroglyphs. These are images created by carving or abrading the rock surface to make structures or designs. These engravings give an idea of tool making skills of the early human beings and how sharp those were to create precise designs. In ancient Chinese civilization, writings on bones have been found which are approximately 3000 years old. Alternately, some pottery inscriptions are also found which are approximately 6000 years old. Ancient Chinese discovered the method of tying knots to the ropes for keeping records for counting. Here we can see the known history of development of writing in different civilizations. The Mesopotamian writing system of petroglyphs influenced Egypt's Nile River civilization writing system, hieroglyphs and hieroglyphs. It is also known to influence the writing system in Asia Minor and cuneiform writing system. The Indus Valley writing system is known to be much older and birthplace of fired clay tablets as trade seals and palm leaf manuscripts. The Chinese civilization writing system is equivalently antique and have known to discover diverse writing surfaces from bones, wood, silk, and paper. Now we can see these writing systems one by one. Ancient Mesopotamian civilization developed the method of cuneiform writing system. Cuneiform means wedge-shaped. They used reed stylus cuts to make wedge-shaped marks on the clay tablets and bake them to store information. Here are some images showing different kinds of reed stylus and methods of writing. At first, images are drawn with a pointed end of a reed or wood stylus and cuneiform images are created by impressing the edge of a stylus into the clay. Next, we shall see how the methods of writing that Indus Valley civilization developed. They also used tablet designs for trade and administration seals. Apart from this, they developed the palm leaf for making writing surface. Although very old evidences are not found, but the records written on these manuscripts indicating astronomical dating system and proven to have written some six to 8,000 years ago. Many of these manuscripts are under research to find out exactly how old are these. Here in this slide, we can see the making of palm leaf manuscript. 
The steps are as follows. The selected varieties of palm are Palmyra palm, Talipot palm or fan palm. The, a typical palm leaf text used to last between a few decades to about 600 years. Therefore, needs to be rewritten again and again. For the purpose of making a writing surface, a young leaf bud is cut from the tree. The folds are opened and separated by cutting with a sharp knife. The hard edges or ickles are then removed to obtain soft and flexible stripes which can be rolled in a circular form and tied together as shown in the picture. In the next step, a paste of medicinal herbs is made by pounding the ingredients together and boiled with water in a large pot. The palm leaf rolls are put in this pot and boiled for 5 to 7 hours. The rolls are then opened and hung on a string for drying. The stripes are dried for 7 to 8 days away from direct sunlight to prevent them from getting black. The dried stripes are then pulled back and forth across a cylindrical wooden surface to render them smooth and uniform. A desired size is then cut from these smoothened stripes. The leaves are then held together and fixed across a wooden base and singed with a hot iron to smooth the edges and burn out the irregularities. The leaves are then stung together by punching a hole using a sharp pointed steel or copper needle. Below is the picture of needle and its casing. The leaf stripes are now stacked together and encased inside wooden casing and tied with threads. This is now ready for supply for writing scripts. Here we see the method of writing on a palm leaf. The leaf is held between the fingers and the letters are carved and etched with a sharp pointed stylus and then the ink is smeared over the surface. Ink is made of charcoal or carbon black or lamp black and mixed with a resinous oil. The surface is then wiped with a muslin cloth piece and then the surface is cleaned by rubbing shipped rice barn and a cleaned leaf with darkened and highlighted manuscript is shown in the picture below. A darkened and highlighted manuscript leaf after cleaning by shipped rice bran smearing and wiping is shown here in the picture. The manuscript leaflets are further treated with preservatives for long shelf life. Preservation often utilized uses of walnut fruit, artemisia oil, cinnamon oil, equisetum stem, circum roots, rhizophora leaf, tobacco leaf, and bigartic plant oil. The manuscript written in the leaves are then tied together and tied with a string and encased with a wooden encasing. Here in the picture below, a stack of manuscript in a library shelf is shown. Here are a collection of pictures of a stylus used for writing and another picture of painting made on a palm leaf surface is shown. Another writing surface material used in ancient Indian subcontinent were obtained from Himalayan birch tree. The bark are quite large in size, ideal for preparing a larger writing surface. Next in the list is the papyrus paper. This writing surface was popular in ancient Egypt, Mesopotamia and Middle Eastern regions of Asia. This writing material is made from papyrus plant as shown in the picture. The stalks are cut from the plant and peeled out. The outer layer of the stalk is peeled out with a sharp knife. Different styles of peeling the papyrus stalks is shown in the picture. The thin slices of papyrus stripes are then soaked in water for 72 hours or 3 days. The soaked stripes are then laid on a hard plane surface and rolled over using a rolling pin. This process removes excess water and sugar present in the tissues.
the stripes are now ready for weaving and different styles of weaving are shown here in the picture. Now the woven papyrus seats is layered between the linen seats and kept under heavy load so as to create sufficient pressure to flatten the stripes. The linen is then removed and the sheet is dried between the folds of dried linen and then again rolled by the rolling pin. This second rolling allows the carbohydrates present in the papyrus to fuse together and remain intertwined. In the final step, ivory powder or a smooth stone is rubbed on the surface of this papyrus seat so as to develop a shiny, smoother and nicer surface. A desired size is then cut out of this sheet. This papyrus paper sheet is now ready to write on. A much simplified reed pens are used for writing with ink. Here are some examples of writing and painting and making drawings on a papyrus sheet by the reed. The ancient art of making papyrus paper sheets have been revived in several villages in Egypt and now it is a major tourist attraction among the travelers who go to Egypt and see this ancient art. The paintings depicted historical events in ancient Egypt are favorite items for sale and to reserve souvenirs. Next in the list is making of parchment paper from animal hides or skins. Parchment is prepared from pelt which is wet, unhaired and limed skin. The animal skin is treated with calcium hydroxide or lime and dried at ordinary temperature. The hairs are then easy to scrape out. The inner flesh side of the skin is ratty and uneven with lingering fats. This site is scrubbed and is scraped using a sharp semi-lunar knife by stretching the skin onto a wooden frame. The scraped and smoothened surface of the stretched skins are then dried for half a day to four weeks. The desired sizes of this sheet is then cut with a sharp knife. After cutting out the desired sizes of the parchment paper, it is further treated by rubbing with pumice powder while it is still stretched onto a wooden frame to make it smooth and appropriate enough to enable the ink to penetrate deeply. Alternately, Powders and paste containing calcium compounds are also used to rub to degrease the surface to prohibit the ink from running away. Also, thin pastes of starch grain or staunch grain, lime, flour, egg whites and milk are applied onto the surface to obtain a cleaner, whiter and shining surface. Parchment remains the only medium till today to make traditional Jewish texts, Torah scrolls or tefillin or Mejujaz in Israel. For these traditional practices, the hides of only kosher animal are permitted according to the Jewish laws and the entire process of making parchment is conducted under strict supervision of a qualified rabbi or a spiritual teacher. It is believed that the Moses wrote the first Torah scroll on an unsplit cow hide called Zebel. Parchment is still popular in some universities to make certificate scrolls to be presented at the graduation ceremonies. The University of Notre Dame in Israel still uses animal parchment certificates for offering its diplomas. Similarly, Harriet Watt University in England co uses goat skin parchment for making their degrees and certificates of graduation. The modern parchment paper is now made by running sheets of paper pulp through a bath of sulfuric acid. The ink forms in different civilizations were unique and independently developed. The prehistoric times, ink was developed from soot and wood smoke and mixed with animal fat and gelatin. 
for writing on palm leaves lamp black or coal powder mixed with a resinous oil was used as an ink lamp black was also used by chinese egyptians and mesopotamians along with colored pigments gums saps or glues to make ink today's ink sticks still follow the age old method of making ink in china the main problem with such inks are short lives or limited durability often the ink would fade away upon sunlight exposure to overcome this problem chemical ink or gall ink was developed during 8th to 11th century ad from tannic acid and iron salt bound by resin before the paper was invented the ancient chinese used to write on silk wood bamboo stripes but the silk was an expensive material and wood and bamboo scrolls were too heavy to carry later on paper making technique was invented chinese used a number of materials for making paper which include tree bark rice hemp fruit peel fibers grass grain husk bamboo straw seaweed fish net rags natural fibers and so on during 1st century bc in han dynasty kai lin brought an improved method which is still an standard method today for making traditional papers the paper became very popular as it was light and durable writing was much easier and the material was much cheaper so as to reach among common people soon it is spread to korea japan vietnam etc during 4 to 6th century AD it entered in india via chinese tibet and vietnamese travelers it is spread to arabian countries and europe during 7th to 15th century AD by 19th century it is spread all across the globe the main steps in paper making are shown here the plant fibers are collected chopped and soaked in water the soaked content is then beaten and made slurry in a water tank the slurry is strained through a fine screen and the fibers are randomly interwoven to make a fine surface the sheet is dried and removed and then further dried to obtain a paper sheet here we shall see two different raw materials for generating paper first is rice straw and wingseltis bark and the second is mulberry bark The straw is collected after the harvest and is steamed and boiled and then taken to the slopes of the hills to spread on for drying. The spread is left for almost 6 months during which the rains and sunlight smoothen the fibers along with natural bleaching. The dried and bleached straw is then hulled under huge wooden blocks. The wingseltis bark is also treated similarly. The straws are pounded into fine powdery mass which is then mixed with water and trampled. The consistency is then transferred to a tank filled with water for washing. A fine screen net is then hung and adjusted on the top of the tank and moved back and forth to collect and spread a fine suspension of fibers from the slurry. The screen is then lifted aside so as to drain the water leaving behind a layer of randomly interwoven fibers the thin smear of fibers is then removed from the screen and is spread over a dry cloth the layers are then squeezed to drain out the excess water and dressed up this step provides uniformity and integrity to the product The sufficiently squeezed and dried layers are then taken for sun drying. Sometimes sand rubbing is employed to obtain a finer finish. The fine paper sheet is now ready for use that is calligraphy, painting, writing, packing and making handicrafts. The second material is mulberry bark. The bark is cut and peeled. The layers of the bark peels are again peeled off to remove the darker outer thin layers. with a sharp knife 
After peeling, the stripes are hanged for drying and then soaked in water for 10 days. The soaked stripes are now fully soft and fluffy as the cellulose have become loosened. The stripes are then dipped in water with plant ashes and boiled for 15 hours. The stripes are now taken out of the boiling pot. These are now scrubbed clean to remove any lumps or knots. The cleaned bark stripes are then beaten, chopped and pounded to obtain a fine pulp. The pulp is then spread in the water tank and a fine suspension is created. The slurry is then collected over a fine screen net and water is strained out. The layer of paper is then separated from the screen and further squeezed to drain out the water. The another method, it can be left on the screen and directly taken for drying in the sun or hot air produced from the fire. Upon drying, the surface can be further smoothened by rubbing with a sandstone. The paper is now ready for use. The traditional mulberry paper is very durable and known to have survived for almost 1000 years. These are often applied on the doors and windows of traditional houses as a curtain material as light could pass through. Apart from uses as a writing surface, the traditional paper is used for making traditional lamps, dolls and dummies for exhibition, boxes, traditional hand fans and packaging materials. Here we shall see how the early methods of printing were developed. This method lasted for several centuries in China, Korea and Japan until modern printing machines were invented. The methods used were wooden block stencils. First, the wood is cut in appropriate size and blocks are boiled and steamed. The surface of the wooden block is then scraped to obtain a smoother surface. The manuscript letters are then carefully written on the paper and then glued onto the wooden block. The letters are then carved using a fine chisel and the entire block is carefully examined for any remaining mistakes. The engraved surface with manuscript letters is then smeared with ink and blank paper is placed over it and pressed so that the ink is transferred to the paper. If two to three books have to be printed like this, it would have been a very meticulous task to prepare wooden block stencils. But imagine if 200 to 300 books are to be printed, this method was indeed a great revolution. Some of the ancient Buddhist texts like Tripitaka were printed and spread over entire China, Korea and Japan and other oriental countries. Later, it is spread to the Southeast Asian countries as well. Some of the wooden script blocks are shown here in this picture. The first two in the left are in Chinese language, whereas the right two are in Korean language. This is one of the famous UNESCO World Heritage Site in Daegu in South Korea. Here a collection of 80,000 blocks containing entire Tripitaka literature of sacred Buddhist teaching and are preserved in Hainsa temple. This is still the largest and unbroken collection in entire Korean peninsula. As gradually the method of writing appeared and invented, the languages also appeared. Some of the main language families are shown here. Every language got its own script of writing and storing information and shown is this map. Here in this slide, the map of main writing systems of the world today are shown and listed on the left side of this slide. As we saw earlier, the ancient people used pebbles, hash marks on the cave walls or earth or tie knots on the ropes to record counting or measuring lengths. The ancient Mesopotamians invented abacus to keep a track of counting numbers. 
This was a primitive device to perform simple mathematical calculations like addition and subtraction. Later on, it traveled to China and other part of the world and people learned to carry out multiplication and division as well. This is believed to be one of the very first information processes to store numbers temporarily and perform calculations. It continued to be an important tool throughout Middle Ages. The earliest known uniform systems of weights and measures seems all to have created at the same time during 4th to 3rd millennia BC among ancient peoples of Egypt, Mesopotamia and Indus Valley civilization and perhaps also at Elam in Iran. Capacities of containers such as goods or clay or metal vessels which were filled with plant seeds and then counted as measured to volumes. For weighing were invented seeds and stones served as standards. For instance, the karat is still used as a unit for gems were derived from the carob seeds. Harappan civilization also used beam balances and standard weights to measure different kinds of weights and to measure lengths they used the ivory sticks. In India, the length was first measured with forearm, hand and fingers and time was measured by periods of the sun, moon and other heavenly bodies. Other measuring units were dhanush or length of the bow, krosha or 1.91 miles and yojana or 13 km or 8 miles. They also used cubit unit which is the length of the forearm from the elbow to the tip of the middle finger. Subsequently, one half cubit is the length between the tip of the thumb to the tip of the little finger. One sixth cubit was palm of the hand and one twenty-fourth cubit was the digit or width of the middle finger. In Egypt, there was uses of royal cubit, which was a standard cubit enhanced by an extra palm and they used this unit for measuring to construct their buildings and monuments. Other units namely foot, inch and yard originated from this but the real sources is still not known. The Greeks and Romans inherited the foot from Egyptians so they inherited the science of writing and architecture from Egypt. Romans made a little more alteration. A Roman foot was 12 inches and equal to 18.5 millimeter. Subsequently the Roman mile was 1000 paces or double steps and a Roman mile was 5000 feet or 1480 meters. This unit of measurement reached to England much later that is 1558 to 1603 during the time of Queen Elizabeth I rules. A British mile was 5 to 8 zero feet or 1609 meters or 8 furlongs. They later introduced yard which is equal to 0.9144 meter. Rulers made of ivory were in use by the Indus Valley Civilization period prior 1500 BCE. Excavation at Lothal, which is as old as 2400 BCE, have yielded one such ruler calibrated to about 1 16th of an inch, that is 1.6 millimeter. Historians hold that the Mohenjo-daro rulers is divided into units corresponding to 1.32 inches which is equal to 33.5 millimeter and these are marked out in decimal subdivisions with an amazing accuracy which is within 0.005 inches or 0.13 millimeter. The ancient bricks used in the architecture and establishment were found of uniform dimension throughout the region that correspond to these units. Trade was largely dependent upon barter system in ancient times until currency was invented. Indus Valley people were known to have invented currency coins, trade seals as well as administration seals to tag their goods for sale to distant places inland and overseas. Mesopotamians and Egyptians also used clay tablets as trade seals. Currency coins of metals such as copper, bronze or gold or silver were introduced much later. It was China which first introduced paper currency notes for trade and is still in use. Coins and currency notes carry information about the value of the world as well as the kingdom. 
Now we shall see a more interesting topic that is measurement of time. A simple apparatus was invented by early civilization people for measuring time during the day. It was sundial. Sundial was in popular use in almost every civilization. A simple stick in the ground and its shadow could tell time. But what to do on the rainy and cloudy day? For such a time, Indians had water clock or ghatika yantra. In this apparatus, a small hole is created at the bottom of the metal bowl and placed in a large vessel containing water and graduation marks were etched at the surrounding walls of the bowl. As the bowl is placed in the water containing large vessel, water starts flowing in. The time taken by the water to flow in and touch the graduation marks one by one could tell exact time during cloudy or rainy day or even night. The description and remnants of the water clock is found in other civilizations as well. It was designed in a modified form as shown in the picture. This is a dripping water clock. The hole is made at the top container and filled with the water that measures the time by dripping the water outside. The other is a container with no holes at the bottom, measures the time by letting water drip inside. The former is dripping water clock and another is filling water clock. Another primitive clocks were the candle clocks and the incense stick clocks. Candles were used to be graduated as shown in the picture. Similarly, incense sticks installed on a graduated metal surface were burned would tell how much time have elapsed. For such apparatuses, uniform size and diameters of the candles and incense, incense sticks were a prerequisite condition and professionally mastered. In medieval times in Arabian world was invented an elephant clock and in Europe rolling ball clock. These two were masterpieces of mechanical engineering. Various components of the elephant clock are housed on the top and inside the body of the elephant. A giant ladle is placed in a water reservoir inside the elephant's head with a hole at the bottom. It takes 30 minutes to fill this ladle as adopted from the water clock and served as a timing mechanism. When the ladder is pulled, it would sink. This in turn pulled the string and rotate the gears at the top with a bird releasing a ball to drop in the mouth of a serpent, which would swung down pulling the string and causing the elephant rider to pound a drum, signaling an hour. The inventor of this apparatus, al Zazari, made several other designs with water clock mechanism as a basis. Another is an electromechanical clock, a rolling ball clock, which was invented in 1970s. However, the idea of atomic clock already appeared and reconstructed in 1955 with a newer concept of second. The latter required sophisticated environment to house the apparatus and we shall see that in detail in later lectures. The clock shown here is an electromechanical clock with using steel balls to indicate exact time. There are three main rails which are numbered for hours and minutes. The bottom rail represents hours whereas the middle and upper rails are used for representing minutes. An electric motor scoops up a ball every minute Every five minutes, the top rail will dump and redeposit a ball onto the second rail. Every hour, the upper and the middle rails dump and one ball is transferred to the bottom rail and add to an hour. Apart from measuring time, early civilization people were interested in astronomy as well. Some of the prehistoric sites are there in reference in Egypt, India and Mesopotamia as well in China. The primitive observatories are more like stones arranged in large circles to observe and create sky maps with positioning of the stars and the planets. Later on, astrolabe was invented and used by navigators to measure the altitude above the horizon of a celestial body. One of the oldest observatories from 7th century AD is still surviving in Korea. It was used for stargazing and situated in Gyeongju.
in india there had been huge number of studies right from the very beginning of the civilization even when telescopes were not invented indians pioneered and excelled in this science and the oldest book on astronomy surya siddhant was written by indians and it is considered to be 6 millennial bc old it has 14 chapters and 500 verses a much complicated book which continues to intrigue people about its antiquity based on the description in this book many observatories were installed in different ancient universities which later on destroyed by islamic invaders or colonial rulers one of the four surviving observatories from medieval times is still functional with its hugely installed architecture at jaipur it was world's largest sundial which can tell time with an accuracy up to 20 seconds Here are some more pictures of sundials with a specific precision of time measuring program during summer and winter seasons. Here are some more apparatus of measurement. Here in this picture there are two It is the application of computers and telecommunication equipment to store, retrieve, transmit, process and manipulate data often in the context of a business or other enterprise that is included in the definition of information technology. The term is commonly used as a synonym for computers and computer networks. It also encompasses other information distribution technologies such as television, radio, print, photography and telephones. Several industries are associated with information technology such as computer hardware, software, electronic, semiconductor, internet, telecom equipment, e-commerce and computer service. The first human beings communicated only through speaking and picture drawing as we have already seen in the previous part of this lecture. During 6500 BC to 1500 BC Pre-Harappan that is in Rakhigarhi and Indus Valley civilizations used trade seals currency coins and rulers for measurement and invented Indic languages and systematic writing system the Sumerians in Mesopotamia what is today's southern Iraq during 5000 to 3000 BC devised a writing system the system called cuneiform and used signs corresponding to spoken sounds instead of pictures to express words The Greeks adopted the Phoenician alphabet and added vowels. The Romans gave the letters Latin names to create the alphabet we use today. The Egyptians struggled with a system that depicted the numbers 1 to 9 as vertical lines, the number 10 as U or a circle, the number 100 as a coiled rope and the number 1000 as a lotus blossom. Around 2nd to 3rd millennium BC the concept of zero and decimal system was developed in India as we have seen the accurate ruler measurement of the length it was through the mesopotamian and later on arab traders that today's numbering system 9 digits plus a zero made its way to middle east and europe and some in during some time in 12th century The first numbering system similar to those in use today were invented by between 100 and 280 by indians who created a nine digit numbering system in 2017 three samples from the indian manuscripts were shown by the radiocarbon dating to have come from three different centuries that is 224 to 383 ad 680 to 779 ad and then 885 to 993 ad making it the world's oldest record that uses the zero as a symbol The next following few slides represent the materials which are considered to be the turning points in the journey of information technology. It is said that during the course of the advent of information technology, human beings tried 1.3 trillion different materials for developing the system of information what we see it today. Storing of information in technical terms is believed to be a breakthrough in information technology in human civilizations 
Long before Gutenberg invented printing machine, block printing in China, Korea, and Japan already existed and lasted for few centuries until in Song Dynasty, 1040 AD in China. Bisheng invented movable type printing. This machine is divided into eight sections. Removable type tables were used to organize the huge number of different types. Gutenberg invented mechanical printing press machine in 1450. People also used painting on limestone for transferring an image to paper, which was still similar more or less to block printing. After James Watt invented steam engine, it inspired many inventors to create powerful machines. Frederick Koning uh, invented high-speed steam-powered printing press, which was one of the important inventions in this direction, which could print up to 1100 sheets per hour. Also, it could print both sides of the paper at the same time. Another turning point in this direction during the mechanical era was invention of logarithms by John Napier. He was a prodigy in mathematics and developed many tricks to solve mathematical problems. It allowed multiplication and divisions to be simplified down to the operation of addition and subtraction. The next breakthrough in our list is slide rule, also known as slip stick. It is a mechanical analog computer. The slide rule is used primarily for multiplication and division and also for the functions such as roots, logarithms and trigonometry but it was not normally used for addition or subtraction. Though similar in the name and appearance to a standard ruler, the slide rule is not ordinarily used for measuring length or drawing straight lines. Pascaline invented by Blaise Pascal was an interesting tool that could solve mathematical problems like addition and subtraction. Sickert's mechanical calculator is considered to be the first mechanical calculator. As we see in this picture, the instrument had several parts, namely accumulator, multiplier, selector, display of results by Nippers rod. Each digit of the six-digit multiplicand is a vertical cylinder upon which is printed the nipper rod for that digit. The knob is used to dial in the desired digit for, from 0 to 9. There is an index rod implemented by the multiplier selector sliders labeled 2 through 9 and the multiplicand is displayed on the top row. This instrument could work with six digit numbers and carry digits across the columns. A stepped reckoner invented by Leibniz was also considered to be the first calculator that could perform all four arithmetic operations, namely addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. It could multiply five digit and 12 digit numbers yielding up to 16 digit numbers. Jacquard's loom was an interesting machine. This machine is considered to be the first machine in the history of information technology for an early e experimentation on computer programming and data entry. The machine used replaceable punching cards to control a sequence of operation, that is inserting and weaving of threads to bring out a particular design or pattern on the textile. For every design, a particular set of punched cards were employed and the loom could change the pattern of weaving according to the pattern of the holes made in the cards to create a particular design and as many numbers as desired. First in this list is the invention of difference engine and analytical engine by Charles Babbage. The difference engine was based on the method of finite differences. It used only arithmetical addition and removes the uses of multiplication and division, which are more difficult to implement mechanically. Analytical engine was a much upgraded and a general purpose programmable computing engine. It had many essential features which are found in modern digital computers. It was programmable 
using punched cards. The idea of punching cards was borrowed from the jacquard loom used for weaving complex textile patterns. It could directly perform multiplication and division and capable of performing additional functions namely conditional branching, looping, microprogramming, parallel processing, iteration, latching, pulling, and pulse shaping. Although Babbage never used these technical terms as these were largely coined much later. Analytical engine could take on different methods of output such as hard copy, printout, punch card, graph plotting, etc. In 1840, Babbage was invited to give a seminar about his analytical engine at the University of Turin. There, one of the attendees, a young Italian engineer, Minabria, transcribed Babbage's lectures into French and got it published in a Swiss journal. Later on, Ada, a young lady, was commissioned by Babbage's friend to translate Minabria's paper in English language as she showed her interest to understand about the Babbage's instrument. Ada not only translated the original manuscript but also augmented her notes on the machine with labeling A to G and the entire translated manuscript became three times longer than the original manuscript. In note G, Ada describes about an algorithm for the analytical engine to compute Bernoulli's numbers. It is considered to be the first algorithm ever published which was specifically tailored for implementation on a computer. For this reason, Ada Lovelace is cited as the first computer programmer. Although the engine was never completed, so her program was never tested. Baba's analytical engine is recognized as an early model for a computer and Ada's notes as description of a computer and software or the first computer program. Inspired by Babbage's difference in analytical engines, the father and son duo George and Edward Shears built the first workable differential engine. The machine could do both, calculating as well as printing. George made the initial models in wood, pasteboard and wires and later on his son made the metal version of the differential engine. The machine consisted of three main parts, the calculating unit, the printing unit and the numerator. The device was used for creating logarithmic tables. It could solve equations of the fourth degree and of even higher orders. It operates in every number system, in decimal system, in sexagesimal system for trigonometry as well. It was capable of processing 15 digit numbers, printing out results and rounding off the eight digits. While the machine was not perfect and could not produce complete tables, Martin Weber reworked on the same and constructed from the ground up and in 1875 created a compact device which could print complete tables. The electromechanical age attributes all its achievements to the discovery of the ways to harness electricity. The information could now be converted into electrical signals or impulses. This era of 100 years is marked by following important inventions, namely voltaic battery, Morse code, telephone, telegraph and radio, electrochemical tabulating machine and advent of IBM company and the late electromechanical age is marked by Howard IBM Mark I computer. During early 19th century, Volta conducted some experiments with two different metal stripes and brine soaked cloth to produce electricity. Later, he stacked several such pairs of copper and zinc discs as electrodes in alternating arrangement to increase the conductivity as well as the yield, and the apparatus was named as voltaic pile. Here in the pictures, we can see the arrangement of the metal disc and the brine solution, and there is a picture of a voltaic pile in the middle. Electromagnetic telegraph communication is popularly known as Morse code. It is still used by the amateur radio communicators and navigators. Also, it is still in use for remote surveillances. Each Morse code symbol is a standardized sequence of dots and dashes. The international Morse code uses the 26 English letters from A to Z and Arabic numerals. A set of Morse codes is shown below here. Here in the picture, an example of Morse code is shown. 
मोर्स कोड कैन बी ट्रांसमिटेड इन अ नंबर ऑफ वेज सच एज इलेक्ट्रिकल पल्स अलॉन्ग अ टेलीग्राफ वायर ऑडियो टोन रेडियो लॉन्ग एंड शॉर्ट टोन फ्लैश लाइट पल्स और इवन अ कार हॉर्न कैन एक्ट एज मोर्स कोड ट्रांसमीटर बिलो इन द पिक्चर्स आर शोन अ टेलीग्राफ की टू प्रोड्यूस सिग्नल्स एंड द सेकेंड वन इज ऑफ अ रिसीवर ऑफ द सिग्नल्स विच कुड ऑल्सो बी रिकॉर्डेड ऑन अ टेप द थर्ड पिक्चर इज ऑफ अ यू एस नेवी मैन सेंडिंग सिग्नल्स थ्रू फ्लैश लाइट पल्सेज द इन्वेंशन ऑफ टेलीफोन इज एट्रीब्यूटेड टू लार्ज नंबर ऑफ इन्वेंटर्स हु हेल्प एंड डेवलप्ड different key materials and methods of sending messages alexander graham bell is credited for one such invention but the other inventors are also duly credited bell's telephone or transmitter that is microphone consisted of following parts and are shown in the picture below the main working is shown here the speaker marked by numeral 1 talks into a horn the sound of the voice of the speaker makes a diaphragm to vibrate the diaphragm is a membrane stretched on a ring and placed across the narrow end of the horn the vibrations move to the coils around the magnet converting the mechanical sound energy into a fluctuating electric current this electric current is transferred through a wire of any length at the receiving end a similar equipment reverses the process and vibrates another diaphragm the diaphragm that recreates the original sound radio wave transmission is different from material waves the discovery of electrical waves traveling through space which can produce an effect far from the point of its origin was indeed a great revolution marconi the inventor was first to materialize this concept however the concept was invented by jc bose earlier who never intended to patent it marconi used a transmitter to ring a bell in a receiver in his attic laboratory during his pilot experiments the layout of his experiment is shown here he replaced a vertical dipole from hertz model with a vertical wire topped by a metal sheet with an opposing terminal connected to the ground on the receiver side he replaced the spark gap with a metal powder coherer a concept detected developed by brandley he was successful in transmitting radio signals for about 1.5 miles by the end of 1895 bose was first to invent the crystal detector horn antenna dielectric lens and other components which are now used in microwave apparatuses Although he never believed in patenting his inventions his contributions to the field remained unacknowledged for a long time until in 2012 his experimental work on millimeter band radio was given credit and recognized as an IEEE milestone in electrical and computer engineering his spark gap transmitter generated 12 to 60 gigahertz microwaves the instrument layout is shown here in the picture and the various parts are listed A receiver using a junction detector consisting of fine steel spring mounted in a horn antenna connected to a bias battery and galvanometer. The transmitter wave guide and the receiving horn were pointed at an optical stand on which the reflectors, diffraction gratings and the prisms could be mounted, which both used to measure reflection, refraction, index of refraction, diffraction and polarization of the waves. The radial arm holding the receiving horn could be rotated to any angle about the stand to measure the angle of the refracted beam in these experiments bose was first to generate microwaves and invented the microwave horn antenna waveguide and crystal radio wave detector first in this list is boolean algebra and logic gates boole developed binary algebra and also known as boolean algebra computers operate on binary and everything in binary math to understand anything about computer hardware it is important to know about boolean algebra as all the computational chips work on this principle of binary logic a logic gate is a very small form of a fence door or a switch when the door is closed or the switch is closed in the circuit you can send electricity from one end to the next and the value is denoted as 1 
If it is open, the electricity does not pass. The value is denoted as zero. The computer chips are made in such a way so as to follow this mechanism to carry out the operations. All operations thus have to be encoded in binary language and for computation it is specifically called as assembly language. In assembly language, every instruction is broken down into and become a series of zeros and ones to be fed through as input and received as the output. As the time passed, these gates got not only faster to open and close as well as smaller and smaller and smarter to manufacture. A simplified version and pictorial representation of Boolean algebra is shown below and the gates are also displayed here. The invention of vacuum tubes is considered to be the most important part in the information world as it allowed to incorporate the electronic system. A vacuum tube consists of two or more electrodes in a vacuum inside an airtight envelope. The device controls electric current flow in a high vacuum space and case inside the tube between electrodes to which the electric potential difference has been applied. The simplest vacuum tube is a diode containing only a heated electron emitting cathode and an anode. Electrons can only flow in one direction through the device from the cathode to the anode. This was an important prerequisite to make electronic gates or electrically controlled switches in a computer hardware. These devices become a key component of electronic circuits for the first half of the 20th century. These were crucial to the development of radio, television, radar, sound recording and reproduction, long distance telephone networks and analog and early digital computers until the advent of semiconductor materials in 1940s. Electromechanical tabulating machine was the first automatic card feed mechanism for punching cards. Hollerith invented this machine, also the first key punch machine to produce punching cards meant for input of data to the machine for processing and output of the results as well. Thus, the machine became a systematized computer input-output machine and marks the beginning of the era of semi-automatic data processing system. Hollerith upgraded the idea of punching cards for the information storage to create a punching card tabulating machine to input data for 1890s US census. Following his success, he founded Tabulating Machine Company and later expanded the same to Computing, Tabulating and Recording Company which was renamed to IBM or International Business Machines in 1924. An important part in the information world was development of theoretical computation and algorithms. Standard terminologies such as Turing complete, computationally universal and Turing equivalence attributed after Alan Turing's work and accomplishments on theoretical computation is considered to be an important turning point. Alan Turing is known for wartime code breaking, particularly that of German ciphers encrypted by Enigma and creating an electromechanical device called Bombay and a replica of the same is shown in the picture below. He worked on the design of automatic computing engine and created a blueprint for the storage programmable computers but the machine was never built. However, the model concept was adopted by many tech companies worldwide. He proposed an important experiment called Turing test for the tech industry to standardize their new application equipments. His work on theoretical computer science led to the foundation of Turing machine, which was considered to be a model for the then upcoming general purpose computers. Turing complete, computationally universal and Turing equivalence are the terms coined after his name, which are used to describe the computational power of a computational system, such as an abstract machine or a programmable language. A computational system that can compute every Turing computable function is called Turing complete. A system is called Turing equivalent if every function it can compute is also Turing computable. That is, it computes precisely the same class of functions as do the Turing machines. The term computationally universal is used with respect to a Turing complete class of systems. That is, it can compute every function computable by systems in that class or can simulate each of those systems.
John Atanasoff and Clifford Berry, a team of a professor and his graduate student, completed the first all-electronic computer called ABC or Atanasoff Berry computer in the basement of the physics building at Iowa State College during 1939 to 42. The machine was, however, the first to implement the three critical ideas that are still part of every modern computer, that is, using binary digits to represent all numbers and data, performing all calculations using electronic rather than wheels, ratchets, or mechanical switches, organizing a system in which computation and memory are separated. But the machine was not Turing complete computer. Conrad Zeus was a civil engineer. He worked remarkably in both the fields, namely inventing a modern computer and a helix tower for new era building designs. His first programmable computer was Z3. It was a Turing complete machine capable of computing all possible outcomes of a standard set of calculations, but it lacked conditional branching. His other contributions include development of high level programming language, plan calculus, high precision large format plotters, namely Graphomat, Z64, Z90, and Z9004. Z1 consisted some 30,000 metal parts and had limited workability. It was revised to Z2 using telephone relays and further upgraded to Z3, which was a binary 22-bit floating point calculator featuring programmability with loops but without conditional jumps. It also had a memory and a calculation unit. The calculation unit was largely made up of telephone relays mainly collected from the discarded stocks. Jews also built S1 and S2 computing machines which computed aerodynamics corrections to the wings of radio controlled flying bombs. S2 had an additional feature of integrated analog to digital converter under program control making it the first process controlled computer. Jews Helix Tower was a lightweight construction mechanism. The Helix Tower is a mechanical, continuously extendable and retractable height adjustable tower construction. He intended this tower to be used for wind power installations, observation and radio transmission. One of the verification of Jews' ideas is the first automated disassembly of two high-rise buildings in the downtown of Tokyo in 2008. Here is a picture of simulation and pilot test of new automated construction method. An automated system ensembles the floor in the ground floor level and then the hydraulic presses raise the floors and the building step by step to make a tower. Here is another picture of Emirat construction strategy for floor wise up pushing of the whole building in Kajima, Japan. Here you can watch the YouTube video on the Helix Tower and its working mechanism. Inspired by Charles Babbage's difference engine during his doctoral research, Howard envisioned an electromechanical computing device that could do much of the tedious work, that is operating the complex mathematical operations such as differential equations. This computer was originally called as ASCC or Automatic Sequence Controlled Calculator and later on he renamed this as Harvard Mark I. 
He also developed 2421 code, also called as Aiken code. It was a complementary to binary coded decimal or BCD code. It was a group of four bits assigned to the decimal digits from 0 to 9 as shown in the picture on the left and is still used today in digital clocks, pocket calculators and similar devices. Aiken found funding from IBM as well as engineering and construction assistance for his work on Mark I, which he completed and installed in Harvard University lab in 1944. Later on, he built Harvard Mark II, III and IV. Mark III used some electronic components and Mark IV was the all electronic machine. The two used magnetic drum memory and Mark IV used magnetic core memory. We shall see this in detail in our later lectures. Below are the pictures of Harvard IBM Mark I computer, the close input and output control readers and the program readers and the automatic typewriters. Mark I was used with 750,000 parts. It could do three additions or subtractions in a second a multiplication in 6 seconds, a division in 15.3 seconds, and a logarithmic or a trigonometric function over a minute. Mark I read its instructions from a 24-channel punched paper tape. It could execute a current instruction and then read into the next one. A separate tape could contain numbers for input, but the tape formats were not interchangeable. The machine used 500 miles or 800 kilometer of wire with 3 million connections, 3,500 multiple relays with 35,000 contacts, 2,225 counters, 1464 tinapels, switches, and tires of 72 adding machines, each with 23 significant numbers. It was indeed the industry's largest electromechanical calculator. ENIA, that is Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer, was the first electronic general purpose digital computer. It was Turing complete. It was capable of solving a large class of numerical problems through reprogramming. It was a thousand times faster than the previous electromechanical machines. Here in the pictures on the left, there are four ENIAC panels and one of its three function tables on display at the School of Engineering and Applied Science at the University of Pennsylvania. On the left is a function table for reading in a table of data. There are four panels. The leftmost one controls the interface to the function table. The third one is an accumulator memory for storing a 10-digit number, which can be added into. On the top right and below are the engineers working on ENIAC. One of the engineers, Edwin Goldstein, is shown to set the switches on ENIAC's function table and in the background, another engineers, Glenn Beck and Betty Sindner, are shown to working on to program the ENIAC. The huge machine harbored 20,000 vacuum tubes, 7,200 crystal diodes, 1,500 relays, 70,000 resistors, 10,000 capacitors and approximately 5 million hand-soldered joints. Edwork, that is Electronic Discrete Variable Automatic Computer. It came in 1949. The Edwork was a binary serial computer with automatic addition, subtraction, multiplication, program division, and automatic checking with a ultrasonic serial memory capacity of 1044-bit words, later on 1024 words, thus giving a memory in modern terms of 5.5 kilobytes. Edwork's average addition time was 864 microseconds, about 1,160 operations per second, and its average multiplication time was 2,900 microseconds, that is about 340 operations per second. The computer had almost 6,000 vacuum tubes and 12,000 diodes and consumed 56 kilowatts of power. Next in the list is the Manchester computers during 1947 to 1977. Manchester computers is a series of stored program electronic computers developed during the 30 year period by a small team at the University of Manchester led by Tom Kilburn. The series included the first stored program computer, the world's first all transistor computer, 
and the world's fastest computer. Here is a list of computers developed through the 30 year time by Manchester Computers and it is enlisted as Manchester Baby which evolved into Manchester Mark 1. The picture is shown here in the side and then transistor computer, then Manchester Mark 2, then Muse, then MU5, then Ferranti Mark 1, Mitrovic 950, Ferranti Mercury, Ferranti Atlas and Titan and then ICL 2900 series. Although a series of huge number of computers were being invented and evolved during this time, not possible to list all of them. But the important thing to note here is that not every computer was Turing complete. Neither every computer sustained working for a long time. Many never worked at all. It is said that only 5 to 6 percent of the constructions remained feasible to serve. Nevertheless, rest of the creation did kept the human morale undefeated to continue to create better materials in the years to come. Apart from IBM, Apple computers are, are known to be one of the greatest commercial hits in this field. Microsoft's creation of every man's user-friendly computers approach to every household in the world, which was earlier considered to be restricted only up to the world of scientists, engineers, and program processors. Here in the picture is shown an Apple computer for commercial sale and its specification. You can see here the keyboard, motherboard, the monitor along with a recorder. In the early models, the computing machine were all in open form. Later on, it was developed with a new design encased inside a wooden box with letters Apple computer carved on it. It was largely the artwork of carpentry which gave its commercial looks. In the later years, the sale brought good fortune and it rapidly introduced new models through series of innovations and the rest is history. To summarize, we learned here the history of information technology and systems within four basic periods, pre-mechanical, mechanical, electromechanical and electronic era. We saw a number of materials that inspired human beings from time to time to bring out new materials and then rapidly innovate newer materials to bring the information technology in the present form. The entire lectures have been summarized here. Now in the upcoming lectures when we shall start the detailed topics, we shall cover about about the diodes, transistors, and then programming languages, and the manufacturing units, data processing, as well as the material characterization. And uh, then we shall also learn about the satellite and communications. And now we come to the end of this introductory lecture, that is the lecture one. And here is an assignment question for you. Which of the inventions regarding information technology do you consider the most important and why? The answer could be anything and you can choose your answer and you can write your answer in brief and email to me. And for this reason, every answer will be a correct answer. So please try to write something.